1920s-1930s. Early Eurasianism. Russian émigré movement looking past a restoration of empire towards a post-imperial future. 1921. Eisthod Kavistoku. Exodus to the East. Published. The peoples of the former empire and Soviet Union share an organic unity, different culturally from European or Asian culture. 1991. Gumilevs They Call Me a Eurasianist. Ethnogenetic theory, on the rise and fall of ethnic nations, finds continuity with the early Eurasianists. 1999-2005. Putin sours on the West. From 1991-2001. to 2001, Putin sought to move Russia closer to Europe, but following the color revolutions in Ukraine, Georgia, and the Kyrgyz Republic, he saw the EU and NATO as interfering in Russia's sphere of influence. 2000. Eurasian Economic Community Announced by Putin. Putin declares that Russia has always perceived itself as a Eurasian country. Alexander Dugin proclaims, there will be a Eurasian millennium. 2002. Trenin's The End of Eurasia. This early work looked past Eurasia to a Euro-Pacific alignment for Russia, looking east to China and the Pacific Rim for investment, growth, and geopolitical legitimacy. December 2003. Collective Security Treaty Organization registered with UN. The Collective Security Treaty, which had been essentially a regional agreement until 2002, started evolving into an international organization. At the CIS summit in Chisinau on 7 October 2003 the heads of Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and Tajikistan approved the CSTO Charter. These countries have been members of the Collective Security Treaty Organization since then. 2008. Putin views the Eastern Partnership as an existential threat to Russia. The EU Eastern Partnership, E, project, addressed to six countries in the post-Soviet space, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, was a reaction by Brussels to the deficits of the original European Neighborhood Policy, ENP, dissatisfaction with the leaders of the color revolutions and Guam efficiency, but its implementation was enhanced by the consequences of the Caucasus crisis as well as a gas crisis between Russia and Ukraine. 2008. Ukraine and Georgia turned towards NATO and the EU, because of their persistence and willingness to advance. These two countries were recognized as NATO Enhanced Opportunities Partners. They are two of only six non-NATO members to hold this status. Finland and Sweden also have this status, and recently moved to join NATO. 2008. Europe's Eastern Promise. Rethinking NATO and EU Enlargement. Ronald D. Asmus wrote that economic and bureaucratic outreach from the EU increasingly replaced direct NATO moves in wooing Eurasian nations. 2010. Customs Union announced. The Eurasian Customs Union came into force in 2010 and was expected to become a fully-fledged Eurasian Union by 2015. Previous Russian-led attempts to create trading zones and customs unions among members of the Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS, ran into the sand. 2010. Common Economic Space for Eurasia announced. On 9 December in Moscow, the presidents of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, of Belarus, Ally Aksandar Lukashenko, and of Kazakhstan, Nasultan Nazarbayev, signed a declaration on the establishment of a common economic space, says, and a set of agreements on how this structure would function. This replaced a previous says agreement with the EU which was never finalized. 2012. Pushkov calls the Eurasian Union a geopolitical necessity. Alexei Pushkov, member of the Committee on Defense and Security of the Council of Federation of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation, RIAC member, calls the EAEU a geopolitical necessity for the future of the region, in support of Putin's view of a Russian-led EAEU. 2012. Medvedev's Russia joins the WTO without customs union partners, after Putin had claimed that Russia would only join the WTO as part of a Eurasian bloc. President Medvedev jumped at the opportunity in 2012 to embrace the multinational trade group, leaving Belarus and Kazakhstan behind in violation of Russia's earlier promise. 
2013. Putin positions the Eurasian Union as a counterpart to the EU, but not NATO. During the election of 2013, Putin continued to stress the benefits of the Eurasian Union, but eased away from direct confrontation with NATO, instead softening his message to stress economic advantages and future parity with the EU. 2013. Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova get carrots and sticks to drop EU deals. Russia used a combination of incentives and threats to turn its near neighbors from closer ties to the EU, military aid, especially for Moldova, and threats of energy sanctions and other interference with sovereignty for Georgia and Ukraine provided disincentives for the nations to move closer to the EU and NATO, effecting pro-Russian changes. 2013. Putin shifts focus from Eurasian Union back to Eurasian Economic Union. As the post-election rhetoric shifted, Putin found himself forced to center the Economic Union in his policies, leaving the idea of a more fully actualized EAEU for the future. 2014. Ukraine Revolution signals a look to the EU and NATO. In rejecting the pro-Russian government, Ukraine explicitly turned back to the West. EU, and NATO as long-term partners, ignoring the carrot and stick diplomacy of the previous phase of Russian posturing. February 2014, Russia invades and annexes Crimea, protecting its vital interests and the safety of its forces in the Black Sea. Russia invaded and annexed Crimea, ratcheting up tensions with the West and entering a de facto state of war with Ukraine which persists in 2023. The European Atlantic Alliance's response was muted, encouraging further adventurism by Putin over time. 2015. Putin uses Eurasian schemes as a lever to exert non-nationalist influence. Putin, looking to separate expansionist Russian nationalist ideas from his near-neighbor policy outside of Ukraine, increasingly relied upon the narrative of Eurasian identity and the goals of the EAEU. February 2022, Russia special operation in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin sent up to 200,000 soldiers into Ukraine on the 24th of February. He thought he could sweep into the capital Kyiv in a matter of days and depose the government. In fact, Russian forces quickly captured big stretches of territory but failed to encircle Kyiv. In the coming months they were forced into a series of humiliating retreats, first in the north and then in the south. To date, they have lost more than half the territory seized at the start of the invasion at a cost approaching 200,000 Russian dead. Eurasianist rhetoric is deployed increasingly to turn attention away from Russia's western border.